20 game winner. Got a pitch for the Yankees from 66 to 74. Fritz Peterson. <laughs> Left hander Fritz Peterson. Fritz. Thanks a lot, Mike, uh, and thanks for not roasting me today on your show. I know you had a lot of material you could have used against me, but I know. I'll get you later when some other day, all right? This is a horrible job. Uh, John Ellis called me a couple months ago, and he said, Fritz, I want you to come to my dinner. I didn't even know Johnny had something like this. I knew it was he had a few dinners like this out here, but I never knew it was something like this, and I want to congratulate you, Johnny. Uh, Johnny was not known to be a mental person as far as, as far as really being a brilliant guy. And I'm not kidding. This guy, you, got, you people know it too, if, if you know Johnny. He would read these books like this, real estate books that cost $40, $50 20 years ago. And the guy is a brilliant man, believe it. And I can see it right here with what he's done here. So thanks, Johnny, wherever you are. I don't know where you are. Is he out here somewhere? Because I got to get him later. I'd like to roast him. <laughs> oh, he's at a closing, Spark, he said. <laughs> but I read in the paper today Wayne Gretzky's wife made a statement, and she said, I would like to say a thousand things, but I can't. And that's what I would like to do tonight. I can't do it, though. <laughs> and not because Mel did anything bad. He was too good. He was the most perfect person I've ever seen on the field and off the field. And I roomed with him many years. I, I was with him for eight and a half years with the Yankees. And the man is impeccable. And that is true. The only thing I can say was back in 1970, uh, we were both in the All-Star game, and I went first, and uh, my guy got on. Mel had to come in and face a punch and Judy hitter, Roberto Clemente, <laughs> and he couldn't strike him out. But he did get him out, but a run scored, and we tied that game. Uh, and we went into 12 innings in that scheme that uh, Pete Rose ran down Ray Fossey. But what happened was I was mad. You know, I'm a competitor too, and I didn't like being responsible for that game going extra innings. And so I had to get even. And uh, a writer friend of mine taught me how to get even by mail. And it was, he said, anytime you go in a magazine, you can look through it, and wherever it says, bill me later, you can send in for it, because I can't do anything to you. So what happened on the way home from Cincinnati in 1970, is I got every magazine I could find and filled in every one of those bill me laters for Mel. Because, you know, what could you do? So about two weeks later, we come back from a long road trip, and we get to the clubhouse, and. I, Mel can't even get in his locker. It's full of everything you can imagine. And at that time, I said, I've got to give Mel amnesty because he was my senior. He was a, a, a tremendous player. He was there ahead of time. He was our leader because Whitey and Mickey had left by then. And I, I had to take it easy on him. But I did one more thing. We had uh, what, what we called a contest between the starting pitchers. Uh, Mel and uh, Steve Klein were, we faced off against myself and Stan Bonson. The contest was, we counted our own batting, we were still hitting at that time, and anytime we'd walk or get a base hit or a sacrifice bunt or hit another batter, uh, we would count that a point. And at the end of the year, the team who had the most points would be taken out in the, uh, a place of their choice, of the winner's choice, on the last road trip of the year. 
So we did that and we decided, and my team lost. So Bonson and I lost and uh, they decided to go to the finest restaurant in Cleveland because there's nothing else to do there. <laughs> Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> so we were sitting at this restaurant and I'm telling Mel uh, and Steve Klein, I said, just have whatever you want. You guys won fair and square. Have whatever you want. So we were getting drinks, two for one, uh, cocktails, anything you want. Just take anything. And uh, so they're laughing at us or watching uh, our movements as they ordered two or three desserts and stuff like that. But what Mel didn't know is he pitched that day. And during the game, I went into his locker, took his wallet out, and took his American Express card. <laughs> so when the bill came, and it was a beauty, they're laughing again and laughing again. So I give the waiter the card, sign it, nice tip, nice tip too. <laughs> and about two months later, I get a call from young Mel, and he said, Jean wants to know what this bill is. She got the bill, poor little Jeannie. So I got even. But what I wanted to do is, I thought Ralph Houck was going to be here. Johnny Ellis told me he was going to be here. So what I was going to do for Mel is make a couple of confessions. Because I don't know how you managers like to find out what your players are doing. I know you guys were telling me about Casey Stingle. He wanted to know everything. Well, Ralph Houck didn't want to know anything, which was great for us. But uh, what we did is after he left the clubhouse, we would have our own clubhouse hockey game. When Ralph left at the end of the game, he'd leave and we'd pull out our stuff, our equipment, and Mel was the one. And the picture I had is us with our equipment. Mel is in Gene Michael's locker back there and we're playing, we're playing hard. And this was a year that uh, Ralph Hauk and Lee McPhail finally got us a third baseman because we hadn't had one since Cleet Boyer left. The guy on the right is Rich McKinney. He was going to be our real third baseman and he was going to be uh, a pennant for the year. But Rich went in and drove in on Stoudemire in that locker way in the back and Mel floored him. And what happened with, to Rich is his thumb got bent back and he could not play and we could not tell because we weren't supposed to do that stuff. So Ralph, it was Mel. <laughs> the other one was uh, during off days on the road especially, I was the player's traveling secretary. I would arrange trips and things for us to do and Mel was always one that liked to do stuff. Uh, so we went, where it was an off day in Texas and uh, you remember that one? We rented dirt bikes. So we went out to Lake Arlington, real nice place, and we were going, there were five of us, and we were going like crazy. And Mel was the head of, of the group because he was our leader. And what he did is, and Thurman was right behind him, Thurman Munson. And Mel was going like crazy, and all of a sudden turned off to the right. And Thurman just watched him like this, and Thurman disappeared. <laughs> what Mel had done is seen a big ravine, and he didn't tell Thurman. So Thurman disappeared, and you know Thurman, those of you who do, he was a tough guy, and he wouldn't admit injury. So Thurman broke both the taillight and the headlight of this motorcycle, but he, he was getting up, and he said, come on, let's go. Problem was, he couldn't catch that night. And wherever Johnny is, he had to catch. But Johnny had taken a spill even worse than Thurman's, but because he was the second catcher at the time, he had to catch. So Ralph, the day we had no catchers, it was Mal's fault. <laughs> and that's all I can say bad about Mal, and it's not bad, I can't do it. But one thing last night, uh, Mel told me, uh, he said, that girl, where are you, Jean? There's little Jeannie. He said, that girl saved my life. And Jean, I want to thank you for myself 
and the rest of us for saving that man, because he is the man. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fritz.